Lord spoke to Moses, and Moses was supposed to instruct his brother Aaron as to how to greet the people. And this was because the people were the people that belonged to God, and a certain amount of respect is supposed to be given to the people. And the words that were given were these, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. This peace that is spoken about is the peace that we receive when we are in right relationship with the Lord. And as believers, we need to be in adjustment to the justice of God. That adjustment is when we confess our sins so that our sins are confessed right up to that moment. And then that opens us up so that we can learn His Word because the Holy Spirit will teach it to us. The Holy Spirit cannot teach us when there is sin in our lives. And so it's imperative for us to do that. So let's take a few moments for silent prayer. Confess any and all sins that you might have. And if there's no sins for you to confess because you confessed them as you walked in, then I would ask that you would pray for me, that I would be able to communicate with you freely, completely, and uh, succinctly so that you would be able to understand the clear teaching of the Word of God. So let's take a few moments for silent prayer, and I'll close with audible prayer. Let us pray. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, that you've granted us this privilege to be able to get together and to fellowship around your word. We ask that God the Holy Spirit might imprint these principles upon our minds and hearts that we might be more efficient in our worship of Jesus Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to ask Mark if he would come to read the scripture for us, please. Hello, everybody. This morning, uh, I'm going to read 2 Kings chapter 11. I think I made more notes about this than there are words in the chapter, so I'll try to get through these. So in this chapter, um, it's about Joash. Joash is uh, one of the kings of the southern kingdom. On our chart, he is number eight. He was seven years old when he became the king, and he reigned for 40 years, and he got a good report card, rated as good. <clears throat> he had a good priest with him um, that pretty much kept him in line, and I read that he, uh, he stayed as, uh, you know, walked with the, the way of the Lord until that priest finally left or died. Um, then at the end there he sort of turned bad but overall he, he was a good king um, but as I read this chapter like I want to take off here on verse 1 it says when Athaliah the mother of Ahiza saw that her son was dead she rose and destroyed all the royal offspring so Athaliah is um, uh, Jehoram's wife. Jehoram is number six, or excuse me, number five on our chart. And then um, after Jehoram is Ahiza, Ahiza, wow, Ahiza, he uh, only reigned for one year, and his mother is here in verse one, Athaliah. Um, Jehoram is the one who brought in the Baal worship to the southern kingdom. Um, Jehoram marrying Athaliah, she is the daughter of Ahab, the worst king ever. And she, they have, uh, Ahab is the one also with Jezebel brought in Baal worship to the northern kingdom. So now we have it in the southern kingdom. Um, Athaliah is Ahab's daughter, he, uh, and again influencing Jehoram with Baal worship. Jehoram, the husband of Athaliah, and father of Ahaziah, 
has killed all of his brothers when he succeeded his father, Jehoshaphat, on the, on the throne. Um, Jehu, who we see over in the northern kingdom, remember Jehu was given the task from the Lord to get rid of all of the Baal worship. Jehu has slain another has slain another 42 members of the royal house of Judah. This includes many of the sons of Jehoram and brothers, and then the brothers of Ahaziah were killed by marauding Arabs. I'm going to read about that in a second. You really need a scorecard to keep up with these guys. Um, Athaliah then uh, kills Ahaziah's sons. Ahaziah is her son, so she's killing his sons, meaning she's killing her grandsons or grandchildren. Um, because here in verse 1 it says she wants to destroy the entire royal offspring. Uh, okay, so anyway, these attacks are attacks on God's redemptive plan, which is centered on the, on the Messiah, uh, which is part of the Davidic covenant that was promised to them. She basically wants to wipe that out in the southern kingdom. Remember, it was already uh, ruined in the northern kingdom, um, there's no Davidic line being followed there. Okay, so as I read this chapter, we're going to hear about uh, um, Joash, but before we get there, I want to read a little bit about what I just talked about, and that is over in uh, Second Chronicles, you don't need to turn there, but it's Second Chronicles chapter 22, and it reads, The inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, his youngest son, king in his place. For the band of men who came with the Arabs to the camp had slain all the older sons. So Ahaziah, the son of Jerome, uh, Jer Jerome, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri. He walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counselor to do wickedly. Let's skip down to verse 8. And it came about, when Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab, he found the princes of Judah and the sons of Ahaziah's brothers ministering to Ahaziah, and he slew them. He also sought Ahaziah, and they caught him, while he was hiding in Samaria. They brought him to Jehu and put him to death and buried him. For they said, He is the son of Jehoshaphat, who sought the Lord with all his heart. So there was no one of the house of Ahaziah to retain the power of the kingdom. Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she rose and destroyed all the royal offering of the house of Judah. All right, so I'm back to Second uh, Kings chapter 11. Let me begin at verse 1. When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she rose and destroyed all the royal offspring. But Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons who were being put to death, and placed him and his nurse in the bedroom. So they hid from Athaliah, and he was not put to death. So he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord six years, while Athaliah was reigning over the land. Now in the seventh year, Jehoiad Ada sent and brought the captains of hundreds of the Karites and of the guard and brought them to him in the house of the Lord. Then he made a covenant with them and put them under oath in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. And he commanded them, saying, This is the thing that you shall do. One third of you who come in on the Sabbath and keep watch over the king's house one third also shall be at the gate, sir, and one third at the gate behind the guards, shall keep watch over the house for defense. 
And two parts of you, even all who go out on the Sabbath, shall also keep watch over the house of the Lord for the king. Then you shall surround the king, each with his weapons in his hand. And whoever comes within the ranks shall be put to death. And be with the king when he comes, when he goes out and when he comes in. So the captains of the hundreds did according to all that Jehoiada, the priest, commanded. And each one of them took his men who were to come in on the Sabbath with those who were to go out on the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada, the priest. And the priest gave to the captains of hundreds the spears and the shields that had been King David's, which were in the house of the Lord. And the guards stood each with his weapons in his hand, from the right side of the house to the left side of the house, by the altar and by the house around the king. Then he brought the king's son out and put the crown on him and gave him the testimony. And they made him king and anointed him. And they clapped their hands and said, Long live the king. When Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people in the house of the Lord. And she looked, and behold, the king was standing by the pillar, according to the custom with the captains and the trumpeters beside the king and all the people of the land rejoiced and blew trumpets. Then Athaliah tore her clothes and cried, Treason! Treason! And Jehoiada, the priest, commanded the captains of hundreds who were appointed over the army, and he said to them, Bring her out between the ranks, and whoever follows her put to death with the sword. For the priest said, Let her not be put to death in the house of the Lord. So they seized her, and when she arrived at the horse's entrance of the king's house, she was put to death there. Then Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people, that they should be the Lord's people, also between the king and the people. And all the people of the land went to the house of Baal and tore it down, his altars and his images. They broke in pieces thoroughly and killed Matan, the, king of ba the priest of Baal, before the altars. And the priest appointed officers over the house of the Lord. And he took the captains of hundreds and the Karites and the guards and all the people of the land and they brought the king down from the house of the Lord and came by the way of the gate of the guards to the king's house. And he sat on the throne of the kings. So all the people of the land rejoiced and the city was quiet for they had put Athaliah to death by the sword at the king's house. Jehoash was seven years old when he became king. Well, good morning once again. Today we're going to continue with our study of the commitment uh, that is necessary in marriage. It's uh, called the covenant of commitment because this is when you take your wedding vows. And we want to uh, look or center our attention particularly in the glue that holds marriage together, the psychological glue, and that is communication. And we are also, uh, as we look at this, we want to go over some of the things that make communication such an important matter. <clears throat> in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32, we have the biblical instruction on communication. The very first thing that we note is that we are to be committed to honesty. We have this in verse 25. And so if you'll open your Bibles, please, to that passage. Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 
verse 25 says, Therefore laying aside falsehood, speak truth each one to one another with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. The being committed to honesty means that you lay aside that which is false. And we say, well, that seems, seems, honest, that seems pretty uh, obvious to me. And then to speak true or truthful uh, words with one another. And so <clears throat> we want to be aware of the communication links that exist when one person speaks to another. And we also want to be aware of the message overlays that when we speak certain words, sometimes there's another message that is behind those. And so, <clears throat> let me uh, go over these overlays once again. First of all, there is the silent message. The silent message is when you have made some kind of a declaration to your spouse, and your spouse does not respond. There is silence. And there is silence because you know that there is something that you said or something that you did that is not sitting well with your spouse the silent message. Then there's the backdoor message. And the backdoor message is when you don't completely take responsibility for what is being said, and so you sneak it in the back door. And uh, this is said many times, or this is done many times, in conversations with our spouses. That is followed by the double bind message. And the double bind message usually takes um, its uniform from either the male or the female. The male will usually curse when or accompanying his message. And uh, that's supposed to frighten the uh, spouse and say, well, he really means it this time. She, on the other hand, uses the double bind message by crying. Because she knows that a man can't stand a woman when she cries. And so this way he is now going to listen to what she has to say. It's called the double bind message. Preachers do this when they want the congregation to become more attuned to what he has to say. And, and, they'll, and they'll say something like, do you remember the old time religion? Do you remember how your grandma used to pray? And that is supposed to say, oh, I've got to become more dedicated to the Lord. It is a trick. It is a gimmick. And it is <clears throat> not supposed to be used by believers with other believers. Then there's the diversionary message. And the diversionary message is that red herring. It's that something that's thrown out there that leads the person off the trail. Either you do not want to continue with the discussion... Uh, because you know that you're guilty, and so you change the subject. And the changing of the subject is done in many different ways. It depends on the person who is using that message. <clears throat> then there's the gunny sack. And the gunny sack is like the laundry sack. It's the hamper. You know that there has been a problem between you and your spouse in the past, but it didn't get resolved. So you throw it into the laundry bag or the gunny sack, and then pretty soon there's another and another and another. And then you get into another argument and you can't seem to go forward with it and so you're going to bring up the old laundry. And by this time it smells really good, it is really ripe. And so you'll say, you remember when you did this? And before you even finish discussing that you move on to another piece of laundry and another piece of laundry and another piece of laundry and you don't ever get anything done. And so this is, this is what the Bible means by putting off falsehood. All falsehood. Nothing that you have said in the past uh, that has not been resolved should be brought up again in the, <clears throat> in the discussion. So... Uh, reviewing once again, the silent message ignores the problem by the silent treatment. The person gives you the silent treatment, or the person decides to just silently endure what's going on. And marriage was never designed by God for one 
member of that marriage unit to become a doormat. Not ever. Remember how we went through Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and how God made male and female. He created them both. And he made them this way because they're supposed to reflect the image of God. Which means that both parties in the marriage have got things to contribute to one another. And so when one person becomes a doormat, that marriage is actually not functional anymore. <clears throat> the backdoor message. This is the under-responsibility message when neither the speaker nor the hearer takes responsibility for that message. The double bind message. This is the message, whatever it is that you want to get across to your spouse. And then you saddle it with a big fuss. The weeping, the cursing, and that's to impose a guilt trip on the person. So that the person will feel obligated to do what it is that you are proposing. The diversionary message shifts the focus from the real issue by a change of subject or by name calling. And name calling is one of the easiest ways uh, uh, to get the, the, uh, the subject changed. Uh, I don't know, let's say that you call your husband, you know, you pig, you. You don't really mean that, do you? And all of a sudden, the subject has changed. You have been derailed. You're no longer talking about the subject at hand. So you're not going to get that done. And so the Bible condemns this as being falsehood. The gunny sack, this is a chain of diversionary messages, one after the other, after the other, after the other. And it's guerrilla warfare. It has no real place in conversation between husbands and wives. All right, we also looked at the interpretation circle. And we noted that there's the uh, dark blue color followed by the red, followed by kind of a lime color, the purple, and then a light blue. The dark blue represents the sense. This is what your senses have taken. And the, um, the red represents the interpretation that, uh, of what your senses have taken in. The lime represents the feeling or the emotion that you express uh, upon the interpretation that you have seen. The purple represents the intent, that is the, perp the plan or the purpose that you have. And then last of all, the action that you take is in light blue. And I illustrated this with, you know, that famous... Uh, uh, famous commercial from State Farm. You know, this is Jake. Jake from State Farm. Uh, great commercial. Too bad it isn't on TV anymore. But let's begin once again. The sense. This is what you see, what you hear, what you experience through your senses. This is what is called this empiricism. This is your empirical senses. Where you walk in on something and you see something and only what you see is what you're going to interpret. But you have to recognize that you're not seeing everything that's there. And that's the, th the thing that you need to understand. Your interpretation then is on what you sense. With the commercial on Jake from State Farm, the wife comes down the stairs, hears her husband in the middle of the night talking to somebody on the phone. And he says something like, are you willing to do for that for me? Do you know that I'm married? And immediately she thinks, well, he must be having an affair. He must be having phone sex with somebody. Or he must be setting something up. So she rips the phone out of his hand and says, who is this? And he says, of course, this is Jay, you know, from State Farm. So that's the interpretation. In her mind, she, she only saw a little bit, but she interpreted a lot more than was there. Her feeling was, you know, he's doing something that is hurting me. He's betraying me at one, uh, one way or another. Her intent was that she is going to shame him, she's going to catch the other person at the other end of the line, and then her action is that she rips the phone out of his hand and starts in with her berating. And so <clears throat> you need to be aware that this is what happens each and every time that you come to a situation that is questionable. So you have to expand your sense get all the facts, then that way you will not be pursuing false uh, information and, uh, and coming up with false interpretations. 
Okay, so here is our up update on the outline. We began with a definition. We, uh, the definition of uh, marriage. We looked at the Old Testament law, how marriage is actually defined by the exchange of vows. A lot of people think that marriage is when people come together and have sex. They think that that's the consummation of a marriage. But according to the Bible, it is only when you give vows one to another. When that is done, now you have a marriage. Marriage is based on the integrity of both people. When he is honest and she is honest, then the vows that they're giving to one another hold. And there are witnesses, or there, there usually are witnesses there to see how that marriage takes place. Our third point is that communication is that glue, the psychological glue for marriage. When you begin your marriage, you begin it by pledging your faithfulness, or your loyalty to one another. And uh, this is done at the vows. The wedding vows are not just uh, words. They are the actual proposals that you have to one another. Your wedding vows must be backed up with your integrity. Now, one of the myths that that uh, has become very popular in some Christian churches it is that only the man is supposed to have integrity. And only the man is supposed to be truthful. Only the man is supposed to be honest. But this isn't so. Both have to have integrity. If they both don't have integrity, the marriage is doomed to ruin. So this is one of the reasons why when you have children, little boys and little girls, you bring them to church and you teach them what integrity is. The pastor will do his work as far as teaching what the Bible says. You do your work as a parent and teaching your children how to apply what has been taught from the pulpit. And this is the way that you build integrity. So when a young woman and a young man come together in a wedding fashion, what they say actually means something. It's not just something so that the mother or the bride can start crying. It means something when you say, I pledge to you my faithfulness. And that is so fantastic. Secondly, we noted that communication is a skill. We've noted the definition of communication. We noticed the meta language or the, the, um, the different types of overlays that go on language. I gave you an example of Pedro and Juanita. We looked at the awareness circle. And now number three, the biblical instruction on communication. <clears throat> and we note that in verses 26 through 27, the phrase that is given in these verses is, do not give the devil an opportunity. You speak truth to one another, you put aside falsehood, and in so doing, you are taking a step so that the devil will not take opportunity against you in your marriage. There are satanic strategies and tactics that are related uh, to your marriage. And one of the things that Satan tries to do is that tries to neutralize your doctrinal data bank. That is, the things that you know about the Bible, and they're in your heart, that is, uh, up here. And he tries to neutralize those things by that not taking place. By your not using what you have learned from the Bible. 1 Peter 5, 7, 8, and 9 says that we are to cast all our cares on him because he cares for us. The idea that we have here is that the Lord is concerned with us. He knows not only about our our hurts, but he also knows about our marriages and that he does this so that we are able to bring these things uh, under his care. <clears throat> the ignorance of the doctrine that you have learned becomes another one of these neutralizing agents. And in First Chronicles chapter 21 and the first eight verses, we have an interesting episode that takes place. And that is that King David had been given a promise by God that he would have a son and that this son was going to be king and that uh, there would be a dynasty of Davidic kings and that the dynasty would be capped off with the final Messiah. That is the Messiah who was going to bring in the golden age of Israel and that was going to be one of David's sons. 
with that promise, the promise was that all the nations that surrounded Israel and all the nations of the world would come and pay homage to Israel because Israel was now the most prominent nation on earth. And that there would not ever be anyone who would even lift a weapon or a hand against Israel because Israel was so vastly superior. So that's the promise that David had gotten. So David orders his chief of staff to go out and to, to make a muster of all the able-bodied men who could be enlisted into the armed forces. And his chief of staff, Joab, says, you know, God told you. He gave you this promise. I don't think that it's right for you to do this. And the Bible goes on to say that the king's command prevailed over the chief of staff. And so Joab obeyed. He was under orders and so he obeyed. But this was a sin against God. And so David is ignoring the doctrine that he has received. He's ignoring the teaching that he has received from God and he's going forward anyway. <clears throat> Let me move on to our next point here. Number three, the third uh, agent of neutralization is that uh, Satan tries to get the believer to be disobedient to the word and to the pastor's authority that's involved in teaching the word. And so this is a, a very um, dangerous uh, uh, thing to embark upon because you are turning your back upon what God has given. There are a number of instances that I want to give you as to how this works. And the first of these begins in Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 26. There are a couple of others that I'll point out to you, but first let's begin with a giant celebration that was given by Nehemiah. The celebration is found in chapters 8 and 9. Who was Nehemiah? Well, Nehemiah actually comes toward the end of Hebrew history. That is, toward the end of the history of the Old Testament. Um, Abraham, at the beginning of the Old Testament. Nehemiah, toward the end. David, in the middle. The scripture tells us that when Israel would not be faithful in obeying God, that God was going to send another country who would take the people into slavery, take the people out of the land of Israel, and that this was going to be their discipline. This is known in the Bible as the fifth cycle of discipline. This is, ex this is taught uh, to an extreme in Leviticus chapter 26. So, on August the 10th, that would be like when? Tomorrow? Is tomorrow August the 10th? Wednesday? Wednesday, August the 10th, 586 B.C., a fellow by the name of Nebuchadnezzar rides down to Jerusalem and captures the city, destroys the temple, and takes a whole bunch of prisoners of war. Everybody that lives there. And that's the fulfillment of the fifth cycle of discipline. They were in Babylon for over 80 years. At the end of their discipline, they are brought back to the land. The city of Jerusalem is completely destroyed. Everybody is making fun of these people who have now come back. They're displaced people, actually. They're prisoners of war who have come back to their homeland. And all the neighbors of the city of Jerusalem who were not Jewish are making fun of these Jewish people, saying, Who are you? We've never seen you before. And the Jews are saying, Well, this land was promised to us by God. And he said, Ha ha, where's your God? You were a slave. And so then they begin to put walls around the city and Nehemiah is at the, at the head of this. He's at the spear point. Once all the walls are up and once they build the uh, altar of the new temple, they have a big celebration. That celebration is found in chapters 8 and chapters 9 of the book of Nehemiah. In... Uh, 
in short uh, words, let me put it like this. A great celebration is the first point that we will notice in chapters 8 and 9, primarily chapter 9. The second thing is that the events take place on the 24th day, and the Hebrew month is the month Tisiri. Uh, we'll encounter this in, uh, in our study. And then, number three, Enote Bene. In other words, we need to look at this point with a great deal of care. So let's begin with the great celebration. And it began on day one of the seventh month, and it was called the Feast of Trumpets. The seventh <coughs> month is known as Tisiri. Day ten became the Day of Atonement, which is Yom Kippur. They've been celebrating that for hundreds of years, and so they kept on celebrating it. This is the first time they had celebrated it after they came back from being prisoners of war. So days 15 through 20 to the 21st of the seventh month is known as the Feast of Tabernacles. So you know where I'm going. I'm going to the 24th day. So this is day... 15 to day 21. On day 23, Nehemiah had the people separate themselves from their illegitimate wives and their illegitimate children. Okay, this is a point which requires a certain amount of explanation. When the people came back from uh, being prisoners of war and they landed back in Jerusalem and they started to rebuild, the walls and the uh, temple. Many of them said, you know, uh, a bunch of us men got here, but uh, look at the women, you know. I mean, they were slaves, and they still look like slaves. But look at the fine girls that live in the neighborhood. And so they started coupling up with the non-Jewish women. And many of them had children. And Nehemiah said, you know, we're supposed to be the people of God. That means that we belong to a certain race. If we start intermarrying, the race is going to be destroyed just simply by biology. So if you want to remain in Israel, you have to get rid of your illegitimate wives and your children. And so this was done on one day, the 23rd of the seventh month, the day of of the month called Tisri. Day 24 is the day that is mentioned now in Nehemiah chapter 9. For 25% of the day, that is for a quarter of the day, the priest read to the people from the book of the law. We have this in Nehemiah 9 verses 3 and Nehemiah uh, chapter 8 verse 1 and following. We'll turn to those in just a moment. For the second quarter of the day, the people confessed their sins with, that, with uh, sackcloth and dirt. And during this 12 period of time, they fasted. Now, fasting in the Bible does not just mean that you quit eating. The idea is that you become so focused in studying the Bible that you don't eat. The Bible becomes your first priority. Eating becomes your second or third priority. And so in the 12-hour period, the people uh, fasted because they were getting teaching and uh, they were confessing their sin. <clears throat> Six of those hours were uh, used up in the confession of sin. Nehemiah chapter 9 verses 4 through 38. Okay, having said that, would you turn your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. Okay. Now you're probably wondering why is it that an event that takes place toward the end of Hebrew history 
Why is it that that book is found like in the middle of the Old Testament instead of at the end of the Old Testament? Well, the reason why is because the historical part of the Old Testament ends with Ezra and Nehemiah. And then after that you have the poetical section and you have a prophetic section. And so this is the historical section. There's 11 books in the Old Testament that are... Um, that are historical. So let me begin to read at verse 1 of chapter 9 in the book of Nehemiah. And this is what it says. Now on the 24th day of this month, the sons of Israel, assembling with fasting and sackcloth, and with dirt on them, the descendants of Israel separated themselves from all the foreigners, and stood and confessed their sins and their iniquities of their fathers. While they stood in their place, they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for the fourth of the day, and for another fourth they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. Now I just read the first three verses. Let me uh, have you turn the page back so that we can look at, at uh, chapter 8. And I'm going to read just the first few verses there, first eight verses. And this is what it says. All the people gathered as one man at the square, which was at the front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra, he was the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Now I want to draw a couple of points here. Here's a group of people who have been slaves. They were brought back to their home city, the city of Jerusalem. They're under the leadership of Ezra, who's the priest, who's called a scribe, and Nehemiah, who um, uh, is going to be like their political leader. And in so doing, they actually were working harder than they were when they were slaves, because now they have to work day and night and they have to do double duty because they haven't got an army and so they have to prepare themselves for battle because people want to destroy the wall that they're building. So now the wall is built and they are gathered together in this one place. It's like a city plaza. And now notice what it is that they do. They want the Old Testament to be read to them. See, they could have said, hey, it's going to be a day off. Bring out the lawn chairs. I want some nice cold drink. We're going to take this day off. But instead, they asked for the word of God to be read to them. And this is what made that generation great. So, in verse 1, we see here that the uh, scribe, uh, they asked the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Notice here, men, women, and children who had understanding. Now, obviously, there are some children that can be, you know, 18 years old, they still don't understand. But the vast majority of children begin to understand when they're 10, 11, and 12. And in, in Hebrew standards, you actually became responsible to God at age 12. That's why it's called the Bar Mitzvah, son of the law. And so, there was a group of people, both men, women, and young adults, who... Um, were gathered together to hear. Verse 3, He read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women, those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Now I want you to notice this word, attentive. This word attentive is the opposite of this. Have you ever seen that in church? You know? Oh, when is this going to be over? 
attentive means that they were listening. They wanted to find out what more. Now, we saw that it was a quarter of the day, okay? A day is 24 hours, so this is for six hours. They had a six-hour service in which the reading of the law was done. Six hours. You go to most churches, you're lucky if you're going to get a 15 to 20 minute sermon. And in that 15 to 20 minute sermon, you're going to hear things like, you know what I read in the Reader's Digest? Hey, I got a few jokes to tell you that reminded me, because you know, my life is so happy. Rather than teaching what the Bible says, they waste time. And it isn't really all that much time anyway. But in this case, you see that it was for the fourth of the day. And here the hours are given. Verse um, 4 goes on to say, Ezra the scribe stood at the wooden podium, which they had made for the purpose. This is the first time in the Bible where you are going to hear about a pulpit. It's right here in Nehemiah chapter 8. They built the pulpit for that purpose. And, and beside him stood uh, Mattathiah, Shemach, uh, Anahiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Masaiah uh, on his right hand. And on his left there was Pedalah, Mishael, Milkiah, uh, Heshum, uh, Hashbadana, uh, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Uh, on his left hand. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the peoples, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Now this has become a custom in some churches, that when somebody like Mark gets up to read the scripture, the people just stand up for it. That's to give respect. You still see this when you go to a Roman Catholic church. They have two pulpits. They have one for the reading of scripture. They have another one that they use for the giving of a sermon. And when the man gets up on the pulpit where the reading is supposed to be done, all the people stand. Because that is respect for the reading of the scripture. Now, obviously it's become tradition, it's become customary, and it has really no meaning because if there is no reality, the ritual is meaningless. So, <clears throat> verse 6, Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen. Okay, blessing the great God means that he uttered a blessing saying how, God, how, how great God is and how... Uh, God is the fountain of blessing so that he gives blessing to everyone. Amen is the Hebrew word for yes, that's true, ironclad, you can't change it. When you repeat it twice, it means yes, it's true, ironclad, you can't change it. This is the same formula that the Lord Jesus used time and time again when he says, verily, verily, I say unto you. He said, amen, amen. Same formula. And while lifting up their hands, then they bowed low and they worshipped the Lord with their faces on the ground. Middle Eastern custom, you still, you still see that Muslims do it five times a day. And then you have the various ones that were mentioned a little earlier. Verse 7, also Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akuv, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Masiah, Kelita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, the Levites explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. Now if you have a pencil, you might want to underline the word explained. Because it doesn't mean explained. What it means is that they translated the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. These people had grown up in a foreign land. They didn't speak Hebrew in that land. They spoke a different language altogether. And so here is the preacher standing behind the pulpit and they have all these 
other interpreters spread out among the people and they're translating what is being read. This is probably why it took six hours. Verse 8, they read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. Now look at verse 8 because this is so absolutely important. The reading of the word of God, the teaching of the word of God is so that you, the people, can understand what God is saying to you. This is not just a ritual where we play church like little kids play house. It's a for real thing. And you can have an organization that you call a church, but it's not an organism if it doesn't take into consideration that this word is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So, <clears throat> note bene. The sins that brought so much suffering to the people were triggered by rejecting the teachings of the Word of God. Remember, this is Leviticus 26. This is the five cycles of discipline. This is the political science of the Old Testament. We are told how it is that nations go through these five cycles. And in the fifth cycle, the nation is destroyed and the people are distributed to other parts of the world because they become slaves. So, what was the teaching? Well, in Zechariah 7 and verse 11. But they refused to pay attention and they turned a stubborn shoulder and they stopped their ears from hearing. In Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 11, which is another one of these uh, late history books, uh, you see that the people are confessing their sin and the sin that they're confessing is that the people had refused to pay attention. Plug their ears, turn their backs on the word of God, and this is something that people do routinely even today. It's no wonder that our nation and uh, our churches are suffering so much casualty, and that's because of this. The next verse, verse 12, says, They made their hearts like flint, so that they could not hear the law of the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by His Spirit, through the former prophets, therefore great wrath came from the Lord of hosts. Now there's a couple of things I want to call your attention in verse 12 of Zechariah 7. It says, they made their hearts like flint. What's flint? It's a hard rock. If you're in the woods and you need to start a fire, you get a piece of flint, you know, you strike it with a rock, you get sparks. When a believer makes his heart like flint, his heart is so hard that you will not listen to the Word of God. And when the Word of God hits that flint, you get sparks, and that's what happens to a person. All of a sudden, the person becomes, oh, I don't want to go there. I don't want to follow what you guys are saying. And you get this inner rebellion. That's what the description that you have here. So that they would not hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by His Spirit through the former prophets, that is the communicators, equivalent to modern day pastors. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 2. I have spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in the way which is not good, following their own thoughts. When a person refuses to align himself or adjust himself to the justice of God, then he follows his own thoughts. But the goodness of God is that he is constantly extending his arms. He is constantly holding out an invitation, come and listen to my words. Come and listen to my words. And this is why I say to you when I ask you to pray for our country, because one day the pastors will be gone. You just have to take a drive through the United States. You'll see how many churches have turned into museums or bazaars of some sort or another. Why did they turn that way? Lack of interest, apathy. People 
turn their hearts like flint. They follow their own thoughts. Isaiah 65, 2. Okay, we've looked at these uh, bugs. We've uh, taken a look at the doctrine uh, that you have uh, learned that has been ignored. Uh, 1 Chronicles 21 with David. We see that the believer um, becomes disobedient to the word and the pastor's authority that uh, was teaching it. And uh, the first passage that we saw was Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 26. A second passage of scripture is found in Isaiah 50 and verse 5 where we have the contrast. The Lord Jesus Christ, that's what the LJC stands for. The Lord Jesus Christ is in complete contrast to these people. And even though he was facing death, death on the cross, he still went ahead with God's plan. Let's take a look at this passage just so that we can uh, familiarize ourselves with the wording. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 5. Verse 5 says, The Lord has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. The Lord has opened my ear, I was not disobedient, and I did not turn back. Well, there's one point that I need to clarify here. When it says the Lord opened my ear, it doesn't mean that, you know, he dug out the earwax so that I would hear him. This is an Old Testament figure, it's isagogical. And what that means is that in the Old Testament, when a person became a voluntary servant of his master, the master would take him out to the front door and he would take an awl and he'd put his ear right to the wall, to the door of the house. And everybody who walked by knew this man is a voluntary servant of his master. He will do whatever his master says. That's the picture that is here. He opened my ear. He put a hole in my ear. And uh, this means that Jesus Christ was obedient to God the Father. This is why he says, I don't act on my own initiative. I act on the initiative of my Father. So, verse 5 once again, And I was not disobedient. Once that all is put through the ear, uh, obedience is to follow. And then the last part, Nor did I turn back. And that's what we are told in Philippians chapter 2, that the Lord Jesus Christ was obedient, even to death on the cross. Hebrews 3, verse 18, we have the documentation of this principle of listening and obeying, and we find it in chapter 3 and verse 18 of the book of Hebrews. Would you turn your Bibles, please, to Hebrews in the New Testament? Hebrews chapter 3. And let me begin to read at verse 7. And I guess it's almost time to quit, so we'll just read these verses and then, then we'll quit. Alright, verse 7, verse 17. Uh, and with whom was he, capital H, angry for 40 years? The passage here is referring to that generation that followed Moses out of Egypt. So, you know, we're jumping in the history sections here. And uh, with whom was God angry for 40 years? The 40 years that they wandered in the desert. With whom was he angry for 40 years? Question mark. Was it not with those who sinned? whose bodies fell in the wilderness. And we see that at the, uh, by the time that the 40 years was over, all that generation had died. The only ones that survived were those who were under the age of 20. And they uh, were the ones that followed uh, into the promised land. Verse 18. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? but to those who were disobedient. And so here we see that disobedience has a price. And the price is that you cannot follow the plan of God if you're disobedient to Him. You must be consistent in your obedience to the Lord. If not, you will fall into disrepair. 
and uh, Acts 19.9. We'll look at this next week. Um, for now, let's uh, stand and take our break and come back in about 10 minutes.